Let's do the first question while it's scrolling by. Someone says, it did, why didn't you replace the linker while you replaced the compilers? Because that's more work, and I can only do so much work. I can't magically do everything. Um, you know, it was outputting the .obj format was a substantial amount of work. Outputting uh, functioning x64 code directly is a substantial amount of work. In fact, it's kind of bananas, as you will know if you ever tried it. x64 is crazy. Uh, but there you go. We do it. Um, and I, I, like I said, um, I would replace the linker next if getting compile time down further was my highest priority. Um, however, it's low enough for now. Um, it's low enough that it makes me happy when I hit compile. So I'm going to work on building the game out more, and then we'll come back. When I, when I get a little grumpy about the co compilation going slowly again, we'll come back and... Uh, yeah. Let me, um, let me go to Twitch chat. No, not Twitter. Twitch. Because I'm looking on the iPad, and when the chat scrolls off on the iPad, it's hard for me to go back and look. Oh, actually Twitch did something better. They show message history now. They didn't used to do that. That's cool. Oh no, that's just messages to me, I guess. I don't know. What time is it? Oh, you know, I didn't annoyingly pop this up a bunch of times. That's great. KK Nuckles is asking, What's a good book to read or an easy problem to solve if I wanted to write my own tiny compiler? Just to better understand how compilers work these days and what happens under the hood when I compile something, if that makes sense. I don't really know of very many good compiler books. Um, the thing that sort of gave me my intro to it was Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programming, which is a well-regarded book. Lots of people will tell you about it. Um, I think there's a Python version of that now, which strikes me as kind of a bad idea, but the original version is in Scheme. Um, and they don't exactly really do a compiler in there, but there's something a little bit compiler-like that'll give you a hint about it. Um, but that said, uh, it's not really a recommendation to go do that. <laughs> it's just the best one that I know. Um, I read on the plane to Las Vegas here I skimmed through a couple of compiler books that are sort of two of the major ones that you would find, and I didn't really like either of them. Like They both have good information for beginners, but they also have a lot of things that I would consider misleading. Um, but maybe it's fine. Maybe if you go read one of those, but counterbalance it with a healthy amount of like reading Handmade Network or something, <laughs> then you'll keep from getting fooled weirdly. Someone asks, am I plan, planning to maintain compiling using GCC that will help porting the language to other lesser platforms? Um, maybe, like, I, I originally thought, well, if we keep the C backend around, then, you know, that gives us the ability to target any platform that'll run a C program. Um, and that's true, but LLVM's pretty portable at this point. I mean, not necessarily the actual compiler, but it can target a lot of things. So it may be redundant functionality. However, there's not really a reason. Um, it doesn't cost very much to maintain the C backend, so there's not really a reason to get rid of it at this time. Gary Johansson asks, were you still thinking of doing handmade compiler? Yes. I am, just not for a little while, I think. People keep asking me about it, people want me to do it, and I want to do it. It's just, I, re I realize that even though I'd be enthusiastic to start, I just have a little too much on my plate right now. So, um, but I'm hoping to do it in 20, or at least the first couple seasons of Handmade Compiler in 2017 sometime, hopefully.
Um, Des used is saying he meant run type inference in parallel, but I didn't see the original part of the question, unfortunately. It scrolled off. So if you want to repeat the original question, that'll be good. Uh, when can we play with the language? I don't know yet. Not yet. Sorry, it's not ready for production use. Someday, I was hoping, well, never mind. I'm not going to give a projection. We're just going to say, when it's done, the classic video game answer. Phrygian says, this stuff makes me happy too. Great work, plus plus. Thank you. It makes me happy also. I like just being able to compile, and it goes fast. And it's a very powerful language that has, you know, um, metaprogramming and stuff. Two different kinds of metaprogramming. It's great. Kaido Dragon asks, anything on multi-threading? Well, part of the reason I wanted to multi-thread the compiler, the internals of the compiler, which a lot of people would have said, that's bananas, why are you even trying to do that? Um, why don't you just, like the classic approach is to run a bunch of different compiler processes and then assemble the output afterward. I didn't want to do that because I think it'll be a lot slower and a lot less elegant. Um, and I wanted to gain experience with very serious multi-threaded uh, programming because I've never done, I've done multi-threaded programming before, um, but it's a relatively unserious things like I'm going to kick off a thread to go do some work and then tell me when it's done and give me the answer. Or, uh, but, 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 you know, that work that it does is mostly independent or can be made mostly independent. Or, um, you know, here's the audio mixer thread, you know, in Braid or the Witness, I wrote the audio thread stuff in that. Um, you know, those things are, are definitely multi threaded programming, but they're a different kind of task than when it's like, Here's a compiler where a bunch of stuff is navigating a shared data structure and it all has to be fast. Um, and there's no way to make the tasks really independent. I mean, you could, but it seems to me that that would involve copying so much information that you would lose any speed benefit that you're gaining by multi-threading, right? Oh, to finish answering that question, Um, the more, the more multi-threaded, serious multi-threaded programming experience I get, the more I look at the kinds of concurrency solutions offered by other programming languages, and I don't think they're very helpful on hard problems. I actually ranted about this on the test stream yesterday. Um, most of these systems are seem to be. I can't speak for the actual motivations of the people doing them, but they seem to be built in order to prevent beginners from making concurrency mistakes. But that's not the problem that I have. The problem that I have is doing hard things. So I want concurrency that helps with, or concurrency things that help with hard stuff. Um, I have some ideas about things that'll help, but they aren't actually like thread control primitives. They're other stuff like things like I've spoken in earlier demos about being able to twist the dial on a spectrum between imperative programming and functional programming, right? Um, and I think that is very helpful because if you can make selective parts of your program have no side effects, for sure, like not just I think everything in this file doesn't have side effects, but like if you can guarantee that through analysis, then you have a much greater morale about your program. You, you feel better that a lot of it's going to work, right? I mean, this is what Rust, Rust programmers will tell you, right? Oh, I know it's going to work because the compiler proved it. Well, I don't want to go as far as Rust, but there are definitely some things that can be done uh, that will help. So that is my approach to threading, I think, is going to be... Um, I mean, unless someone tells me a really great idea for it or I have a magical inspiration uh, when I wake up one morning, um, it's going to be more about uh, being sure of what your program is doing than, uh, you know, um, primitives for 
actually making different threads do certain kinds of stuff. A pulsing mage said he handled x64 from a debugger standpoint and it was definitely bananas. Yeah, if you had to decode the opcodes yourself, it's kind of crazy. Um, there's an Intel library that'll kind of do that for you. Um, I didn't use it for this uh, in part because I didn't know about it, uh, but also because I just wanted to do something that I have absolute control over and can make as fast as possible because um, you know, we don't, to, to compile an arbitrary program, we don't even need to use the vast majority of the x64 instruction set, right? You just need to use a subset of it that will uh, give you good results. And so that is what I did. Let me, um, since we're done with slides, I can make my face bigger. Not that you want to see more of it, but it is what it is. I don't know, maybe, maybe about that size. Someone's asking, do I have any plans to have a formal spec or second implementation that would come way later? I mean, I agree that all things being equal, that stuff is good. Uh, all things are not equal. <laughs> and right now, um, you know, right now uh, I'm doing what I can do. <laughs> so, and you know, um, it's not just a manpower limitation, but um, just like when designing video games, coming up with the right design for a programming language actually often takes calendar time, right? You need to be confronted with problems and let them simmer in the subconscious for a long time. And then someday when you're eating lunch, you know the answer, right? That kind of a thing. Uh, you give that time to happen. And so if I start specking what the language is today, I don't give that time to happen. Someone says, is there potential to use the GPU for compiling? I guess there's potential, but GPUs are the most unreliable components, mostly due to drivers in any computer that I touch. When we try to ship the witness to people, uh, in cases where it doesn't work, the main reason it doesn't work is because of GPU drivers. So I want to stay as far away from those as possible because I want to create a robust system. Um, so if GPU vendors get their acts together on stability, which they might, you know, people who are proponents of Vulkan and DirectX 12 and stuff like that say that it will help people make more stable drivers, among other things. And if that is true, then that is great. Uh, but, oh God, that needs, something like that needs to happen ASAP because it's ridiculous. Like no, when we ship the witness, uh, there were different problems on every vendor's ships and you know different problems on different chipsets of cards that were otherwise branded the same with like small difference in numbers like it's complete chaos um someone's asking what's the speed compared to msvc dash od um i'm pretty sure i was compiling with dash OD or at least something like that. Anyway, I'm not that worried about it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Let's go back and look. Well, let's just do it again rather than find it in the scroll back. Uh, wait, that won't be it. Oh, I'm in the wrong file. That's why I'm not finding it. Okay, so we're switching to the C backend. Uh, let's compile with there. Let's see what the options are. Yeah, we're compiling with dash o, slash od right now. So, um, you know, maybe there's some further things we can do to speed the C backend up, but the other backends are so much faster. And the C backend is not terrible, right? 1.7 seconds is not terrible, it's just not excellent. And we want to be excellent. But compiling to C is never going to be excellent, so don't worry about it. Do I even email? What's that supposed to mean? Um, why is performance critical now? You mentioned you wanted to share the compiler with alpha testing friends. Isn't that more valuable to get the alpha version done? I get performance is key, but why now? Well, the answer to that is just that 
part of why I'm doing this is to be happy. <laughs> and to be happy, I wanted it to run faster. So I did that. I mean, it's not, it's really not a thing that's calculated for minimum time to put the thing in people's hands, right? Um, but this is important because caring about the speed um, led me to make major architectural decisions about the internals of the compiler, and it's probably good to do that sooner than later, right? You don't want to dig yourself into a hole that is hard to get out of. Desused says, would it be possible to run type inference in parallel on files that don't depend on or include anything? Um, in theory, that would be possible. I mean, it's possible anyway, right? When they do depend on each other, you just need a little bit of locking. But getting that locking right is the hard part, right? Um, the thing about that idea is that there's no such thing in this language as files that don't depend on anything in the sense that there are no include files, there are no forward declarations, right? You, you basically dump the compiler a bunch of files in a bag and it figures out what files depend on what, or what declarations in any given file depend on what declarations in any other given file, right? Um, so the thing about that is you don't know who you depend on until you've investigated the file, right? So if I have a particular identifier, right, then, you know, let's say it's the name of a struct type somewhere, right? Well, I have to know what type that identifier maps to before I know what file is relevant for telling me about that struct, right? So like that type checking step or type analysis step or whatever you want to call it has to kind of happen before I know my real dependencies actually right um, now that said there's different levels of dependencies and whatever and you can get picky about it but um, I don't I don't really trying to optimize for that doesn't really make sense and adding a way for the user to specify that would add complication to the language that I prefer not to have if we don't need it. So um, my goal is going to be just to make it really fast anyway. And then if we need something more complicated to go faster, we'll do that. Wow, there must be a lot of questions. I'm way behind in the scroll back. What were these two compiler books and can you mention a couple of the topics. Um, I don't remember the names. Uh, no, one of them, you know, one of the books was Compiler Construction in Pick Whatever Language. There's a CML and Python one by Andrew Appel. Um, Andrew Appel wrote one of the compiler books that got me excited about compilation way back when I was in college. It was called Compiling with Continuations. Uh, it's a very functional language approach to compilation. Um, that was when I was very young. I'm not really excited about continuations now. Uh, <laughs> um, and like I said, there's it's it's a good book in that it uh, provides a good spectrum of the ideas involved in compilers. But man, if I were writing a compiler book, it would be very different. And there's a lot of things in that book that I think are uh, either superfluous or are just not the right way to build a compiler anymore. I think the first edition of that book was written in the late 90s though, or maybe even later. So it's not that surprising even, I don't know. Um, the second book, I don't remember the name of or the authors, but it's by some professors from Rice University. And I'm not even, I'm about halfway through that one. Uh, so anyway, neither of these, I'm not recommending either of these as the reference for how to build a compiler because the way I'm building this compiler is a lot different, I mean, a little bit the same as what those books say, but a lot different from what those books say as well. So um, again, it's not my recommendation to do things that way, but if you want background knowledge about compilers, you can look at both those books. 
it's good to be educated about how people do things, right? How much meta compile time stuff is a 33k lock example doing? Um, oh, I didn't mention that. So by the way, it's doing a lot more than the equivalent C program because it's doing basically everything that we ever demoed. So that whole build time message loop where the compiler tells you the type of everything and you look at the messages and see if you want to do something about that, it's doing all of that for the whole program. Um, and it's actually, so when you ran the program, where is it? It's been a while since we actually ran the program. Um, so the first thing it does is it says, hey, there's here's how many types of entities there are and stuff. Um, that is all generated by a meta program. Let me, um, and we've, we've sort of demoed, I wish I knew how to dynamically change font size in Emacs. Can I, can I do it in a menu? Will Emacs please come into the 19th century? God, all right, I don't know how to do it. Um, so we're just gonna have a giant font. I could go try to edit my .emacs, but whatever. Okay, um, I am gonna look in, I think it'll be in this folder. Uh, I don't remember the name of the, I'm looking for the file that gets generated. Uh, strings. Yes. Okay, so I think if we look at added strings, so this gets outputted for debugging purposes, right? Like if you want a debugger, okay. So what I do, and this is exactly like I did in a much earlier demo when I was demoing the, the um, type introspection. I don't remember what it was called, it's on YouTube. Um, so I look through all the stuff that's in the game and uh, that's a subclass of entity and I make different arrays and tables of it and I'll put those as strings that then get compiled, right? Um, so, you know, I make this list of arrays of all the entity types and I make this really crappy function that returns the index of a given type and the inverse of that type of index and I have a bunch of bucket arrays. If you remember that demo of the bucket array, which had the overloading and stuff of the data structure, I have one of those for each entity type so that I can store them contiguously so that we can iterate over all entities of any given type, which is always something that I like to do. Uh, and we can do that quickly without taking a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of cache misses. Uh, I generate an array of all the names for reference. Um, Here's a function that generates a sort of a, a prototype version of every entity type so that we can read off the default fields because in the undo system, you know, if you're in the editor or something and, or, or in the game and you want to undo something, then we look at the fields of the current entity compared to the default and that'll tell us like what might need to get saved for purposes of being undone later uh, or whatever, right? So, and, and that's, so that's the amount of, so I generate about 172 lines of new code that gets mixed in, uh, but this is done based on browsing every type in the game. So it's a relatively sophisticated thing to do, uh, but it's the kind of thing that we've demoed in more trivial programs earlier. Uh, Dr. Jeets, I might have missed this earlier, but have you collected perf data about LLVM builds versus a new backend? Yes. Go watch the VOD or watch when it's up on YouTube. I, heard, I said all that stuff. I probably meandered too much on those issues, actually. Uh, did I find someone to work on the compiler? Yes. Uh, a dude named Joshua, who lives in Connecticut, has been doing really good work on it. And is responsible basically for the entire LLVM backend, and now he's doing some other stuff as well uh, that we'll be demoing in the future.
Knuckel says to maybe wait for Handmade Compiler. That might be the right thing to do. I don't know. It depends on how interested you are. Handmade Compiler might not happen for a long time. So if you want to know sooner than later, um, you know, those books I mentioned are not the worst thing in the world. Uh, is the X64 backend going to be cross-platform someday? I'm assuming it's Windows only right now. It is Windows only right now, but I will say stay tuned for future demos. Do I envision this language being useful for scientific computing? Yes, hopefully. Um, th the one thing about scientific computing is, um, and this wouldn't be bad for video games either actually, is you probably want to do a better job at aliasing detection than like even C++ does, right? Because like a lot of times people still use Fortran uh, because in Fortran you don't have problems with pointers and aliasing and all that stuff. Um, however, again, in the same way that I think controls can be added that enforce that your program is doing certain things or not doing certain things for threading purposes, I think that can also happen for aliasing purposes. Um, and I don't just mean a hint like restrict in C++, but like maybe some things a little more hardcore than that. Um, and then, you know, you could have maybe subsets of your program where no aliasing is completely guaranteed and those should be able to compile really fast, right? Uh, but we'll see. Again, the, that kind of thing is further down the road than where we are right now. Yeah, I should have said this, but uh, a very popular book that people refer about compilers is the Dragon book. Ignore that one. It is completely out of date and, in fact, probably wasn't that much of a good idea in the first place. No offense to Aho, Sethi, and Ullman or whoever are the authors of that book. Um, I, just, I do not recommend it if you want to build a compiler in the modern day. Uh, or even in the 90s. Um, but what you can learn from that book, I don't want to just diss the book, right? So, and I'll say this again someday when I do Handmade Compiler, but uh, one of the things that people rat hole on a lot when they're building compilers is all these ideas about like, let's build a state machine to do lexing and parsing, right? And let's understand if our grammar is like LR whatever or LALR or you know LL and all that stuff and let's build a system that will generate a parser for any LL1 grammar and all that stuff right um, none of that stuff is going to help you build a useful compiler for the most part um, however it's good to understand to broaden your computer science knowledge um, and that kind of thing is good to understand for the purposes of um, making sure, for example, that the grammar of your programming language is unambiguous, right? Um, I would not encourage somebody to use a parser tool like Lex or Yak, which is based on all that Dragon Book kind of stuff. I would not encourage anyone to use that to actually generate code that you run in your compiler, but you could use a tool like that to check your grammar and make sure it's as unambiguous as you think it is or whatever. Right, so knowledge is a powerful thing. Um, I wouldn't discourage you from having the knowledge in that book. I would just discourage you from building a compiler as uh, described by that book. Would I consider making a JavaScript framework? No. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, that's something, if somebody else wants to do that later, once the compiler is released, go ahead. But that's not really uh, something I'm interested in. Am I going to release to everyone at once or a smaller group first? I will do a smaller group first because we want to iron out problems before we hit everybody with problems, right? I'm very conscientious about the, or the, the scale issues that happen, right? If you release something that's kind of buggy or doesn't work right or is too slow or something, then the number of people affected can be very large if you release it to everybody, right? So we get those things right first on a small number of test subjects and then we release it to the bigger world. A 
Someone is saying you're now making the compiler faster to cut the iteration time while working on code, but do you think that soon the gains will be bigger by cutting the amount of iterations by improving other parts of the work environment, IDE, etc.? I'm not a big fan of the idea of an IDE, honestly. Um, I most or every IDE that I know of uh, mostly gets in the way and makes it so that my setup won't work on different operating systems or whatever because they don't have the same IDE, right? Or the IDE doesn't work the same or whatever. Um, and even what the IDE claims to do, I'm not that interested in. I, I mean, I, here's what I want. I want a good editor, I want a good debugger, and I want a good compiler. That's only three things. And why do they have to all be in the same window even? I don't care. Um, I actually, when I use Visual Studio now, which is supposedly like fully on integrated, I don't use the editor in Visual Studio because it's terrible, right? I use Emacs, which is also kind of terrible now uh, by modern standards, but it's way less terrible than Visual Studio. So it's kind of the lesser of two evils at that point. Um, yeah. So I'm not that, people ask about IDEs often and I just, you know, I'm doing a lot of things differently than how most people would do them. And one of the things I'm doing differently is not caring that much about IDE. Um, I do care very much about being able to program effectively and being able to debug effectively. I just don't think IDE, IDEs have a poor track record. Don't they? Don't they? Be honest, don't they? Am I planning to hire someone to document the language? I'll probably do the initial documentation initially. It just won't be for a while. Uh, do I take any stance on the family of optimizations enabled by the C, what the C languages refer to as strict aliasing? Um, well, I mean, the aliasing story isn't figured out yet, basically. Like I said a little bit earlier, you probably asked that before I gave the earlier answer, um, but I uh, I think that rather than just putting in hints that the programmer could type in correctly or making arcane rules like you're only allowed to cast from one pointer type to another point pointer type through care star, like what what is that? That's nonsensical, right? Um, Rather than that kind of bizarreness, I think if you design from the outset for aliasing detection, all right, you want to know that things are not aliased, right? That's the goal. Um, if you design from the outset for that, you can do some interesting things if you take it seriously. And so that's the plan. I just don't know exactly what those things are yet. I have some ideas in that direction. Are most of the big ideas already implemented in the front end that I wanted? Uh, most of them are implemented. Um, I, I've been hinting at the ones that aren't implemented yet. Let's put it that way. And that's really all that I know to say. Like right now, the next thing I do is I'm going to go back to the game and be working on the game in the language. And that'll probably drive me to do a few things. Like I don't have a freaking switch statement yet. I just have if statements and like, which, which is why, for example, when I looked at, at this, where was it? These functions are series of if statements because we don't have a switch statement. So it's either if statements or like a table, um, a data table. And so I didn't want to do that. Uh, <laughs> so, so that might happen. There's probably some small things that have to happen next. Will it be possible to implement a Rust style borrow checker as an opt-in library, I believe it should. Um, I haven't tried it, but if you go back and watch some of the earlier demos that are about, um, you know, I don't, I don't remember the name of this one, but there's a demo where I go back to the metaprogramming and show how powerful it is now. Like I demonstrated metaprogramming, you know, very early on, right? First demo actually. Um, but I went back several months ago and said, hey, you know, now it's hardened so that you can do a certain class of things. And I did stuff like audit your code for um, 
you know, making sure it complies with various rules. And in fact, I picked some rules from MISRA C, which is an automotive uh, code specification for the auto industry and other things, and implemented a few of those rules just as a proof of concept, right? Now, uh, the type of thing I demoed is much less serious than the Rust Borrow Checker, uh, but it is in the same direction. So I believe in principle you could do that. Um, and again, I, I have no problem with that, right? I've said before that I think rest on the whole is a little too high friction. But if you want to opt into high friction, I think that's fine, right? If you as a developer want to make that trade off, I want safety really badly and I will pay for it by having more errors in my face or whatever. That's great. Like, you know, if you're if, if that's intentionally the trade off that you want to make. Um, you could make that trade off for certain files very easily, right? With, with the sort of metaprogramming system we have here, you could just put files in a whitelist or a blacklist about whether they get uh, borrow checking stuff. Now, you get to then maybe figure out what the interface is between those and like what happens such that the borrow checker doesn't just give up and is useless. But you know that would be a thing to figure out. Um, and I think it would be a lot cleaner and more wieldy than you know the unsafe mechanism in Rust. Because you can opt into different mixtures of checking, right? Um, not just borrow checking, but all the other kinds of checking we've demoed as well. Have I thought about struct literals, closures, switch case, etc.? I've just mentioned I'll probably do switch. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do crazy pattern matching. I might just do C++ style switch, except maybe it'll handle strings as well. Um, I don't know. Uh, closures, I'm probably going to do eventually. All the groundwork has been laid for them. I just haven't done it. Struct literals is just a matter of typing in the code. I just haven't done it. Wait, maybe struct literals actually work now, actually. I think if you have an array of structs it actually work let me um, it does work I know this because I use it so here um, here's sort of the main program for this game and okay this syntax is not great so we have a game mode info struct right which has just like okay in that game mode here's how your game is saved here's procedures to start and advance the game Right, and here's some game state struct, right? So, and then I just have, uh, you know, this thing is an array of game mode infos, and these are the structs. So, you know, struct literals kind of mostly work. This syntax is a little weird, but like I said, um, syntax is not really the big concern right now. Someone's asking about concurrency in games. Um, I can't go into, it's too big of a topic right now, sorry. That could be like a whole couple of hours. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't go into it right now. I'm starting to lose my voice as well. Dr. G says this thing about functional imperative spectrum sounds like the thing you mentioned long ago about prohibiting functions from referencing globals. Are you looking at implementing something related to that soon? Yeah, something like that. Now, you know, I've already demoed that with metaprogramming, you can already do stuff like that, right? So you can, you know, again, whitelist or blacklist various files from referencing things outside their own file or whatever. Um, I've demoed that before. The question is just, um, is there something to be gained by having a built-in syntax to the language? And maybe there is, but I need to think about it. Um, but yeah, you can already actually do that. Um, the question is, can we do it better? Can I make the cam bigger and put it on the left? I'll put it on the left, right? So, sorry, I thought it was going to be, well, no, if I flip back to code, it, you're going to be happier that it's on the right. And the code is more important than the message history. So sorry, I'm going to leave it where it is. 
Oh my God, I'm so far up the chat. Guys, I don't know if I can do all these questions. I'm still starving. I need to go down and have a 1 a.m. dinner in Las Vegas. 2 a.m. dinner, God. Okay, I'm going to skip that question because it would be a spoiler. How hard is it going to be to get rid of the Microsoft Linker? I, I don't think it's that hard. It's probably less work than what I've already done on the x64 backend. Um, I just haven't done it and I'm not ready to do it because I want to go off and do something else. Um, I don't think it's that hard though. Like if you generate an OBJ file, um, that's actually not that different from a, a .exe file, right? They're, they're sort of the same package format, kind of. And so the question is just then, how do you link to the libraries? And I could either duplicate, you know, so external libraries like, you know, like we're using FreeType, for example, in OpenGL, right? So how do you link those into your program? There's ways it can be done that are faster than what's happening. Can I compile straight to a DLL if I use no external dependency? Um, I want to enable that as an option, but uh, right now we don't do it yet. Right now we just go to an EXE always. Am I programming the new game project already in this language? Uh, yes. So in saying these speeds would be super useful for an IntelliSense equivalent, stupid sense, or however people call it, yeah, I mean, when your compiler is very fast, you can use it to generate information about the program for sure. So that an editor could just call out to the compiler and ask it what to make of this thing you just typed. And then you, your editor doesn't have to, you know, for example, have its own syntax formatting code. It could read a data structure, pass back to it by user level code that's run by the compiler. So it can be in your own format and everything. Like all of that is possible right now. Would or have I ever considered writing a book based on computer video game design or general computer programming, et cetera? I've thought about writing a book, but it's not time for that. Maybe when I'm old and gray, it'll be time. You gotta take books seriously, man. Gary Johansson says, I know the answer to the question, I think, but do you think it would be good for the compiler to have a strong compression and uncompression option so you could massively generate pre-compiled function cases to make code faster, if that makes sense. Do you, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think you maybe mean, like I've demoed before, that you can take a particular function and compile different versions of it with the parameters hard-coded to different values, right, for optimization purposes. Is that what you mean? Um, if so, then I don't think that's going to be a speed problem anyway. But we'll see. It might be. And if it becomes a speed problem, then maybe it's something the compiler could have handle automatically. Because like I've shown already, the, the type checking stage is the slowest stage. Um, if you're going to hard code a parameter to a certain value, its type is still the same. I mean, you might get a little bit more optimization from that phase, but for the most part, the optimizations happen later. So um, you could, in theory, reuse the same work from the previous procedure. I just don't right now. Um, there's things like that that could happen. But I think they're all further down the road from actually just getting this done in a first version. Someone said, greeting scar says, can I have a meta thing that generates the entity type associations so you don't have to mess with it each time you add an entity? Um, that is actually what I already do. So that code that I showed um, here, right? This is automatically generated. I didn't type any of this, right? So what happens is it looks at all the structs in the game, sees if they're derived from entity, and if so, it adds them to all of these things. So it's fully automatic. I can add a new entity and it just shows up. I've demoed that previously. 
Uh, no, the, the, the source for this is not available. Sorry. It's secret. It's it's the game that we're making, man. Could I show you the X64 backend code? Uh, not today, because I'm tired. Um, we could maybe do that. We could do a special topic where I just sort of page through it and talk about how it works, maybe. Uh, bug me on Twitter or something about that if you really want to see that happen. Um, it's a fair amount of code. Like, let's let's go see. Like, there's sort of two files. There's the object file writer, uh, which is a significant part of it. That's 12, 1300 lines. And x64 uh, converter is uh, about another 18, uh, right? So that's it's a little over 3,000 lines of code, including white space and comments, right? So it's not too much. We could kind of go through it, I think, maybe. Who can say? Knuckle says, do I understand it correctly that this language doesn't really need a classic debugger because it has a really good visualization and telemetry? Um, I, I would like a classic debugger, actually, but I would also like the debugger um, to be better than classic debuggers, right? And so this kind of visualization helps. Um, so um, debugger integration uh, is good. We already demoed actually previously that if you compile with LLVM, um, you can debug kind of reasonably in Visual Studio already. So we're in an okay spot on that. We're not in a great spot on that because LLVM's support for Visual Studio debugging is not perfect, uh, but um, we're doing okay. Uh, someone's asking about, do I want to make this play nice with as many tools as possible, or do I have plans to make my own tools? My plan is no tools. Tools are terrible. Like, I mean, they're great because they do something you want, but the problem is we get bogged down in these ecosystems of tools and then you know, it's a pain to try to compile on multiple operating systems or something, right? Because they all have different tools. It's terrible. Um, if you have a job where you're supposed to deploy something on four different operating systems, your life is not very fun right now. So the whole, or one of the overarching themes to what I'm doing is that all the stuff that we use tools for, for example, like building your freaking program, you don't need tools. You're Programming language is already more powerful than that, or should be. So, um, yeah, go watch the earlier. I mean, there's a lot of videos on YouTube, uh, but if you watch them, you'll see some of this stuff. All right, I'm going to start skipping through questions, so I got to get to the end. I'm tired. It's 1 30 in the morning. What about Sublime Text? Um, I've never used Sublime Text, so I don't know anything about it. Am I going to overhaul the syntax once the language is feature complete? Yes, this syntax is all temporary. Anything can change, anything. It'll remain, you know, a, it's curly brace style syntax language. It's not gonna become, you know, Lisp or something. Um, but it'll, it'll get a syntax cleanup for sure. In fact, a lot of the time, because I know I'm gonna do a syntax cleanup, I often don't think that hard about syntax for things. So like the array instruct literal syntax is weird just because I don't care yet. <laughs> Joe Duffy's article, 15 years of concurrency, might have interesting ideas on aliasing. Um, sure, I'll check that out. I'll put it up. 15 years of concurrency. Oh, it's a recent article. All right, cool. Gary Johansson says, I don't mean speed problem with the compiler, I mean speed up the actual game code. Yeah, that's the purpose. That's sort of what I thought you meant, or I, I sort of meant both, right? Um, y yes, you can already speed up the game code by generating variants of procedures. The question is just, like, to get to the kind of combinatorics you're talking about where it would make the compilation a lot slower because you're generating so many um, to make your program fast, at some point that stops working and your program stops getting faster and starts getting slower. So like, where is that threshold? I don't actually know. Oh, 
Oh, he's saying tools as in editors, debugging, etc. Um, for editors and debuggers, yeah, we definitely want to work with whatever editor and debugger, but the approach to that is going to be to, um, to be general, right? So like I said, you can already create a meta program that, for example, uh, introspects on your entire program and outputs um, you know, type tags are like, here's where all the identifiers are defined, right? So if you type in an identifier in your editor, you can get the file and line info, right? So then all the editor has to do is read whatever output file you outputted from that, and then your editor understands the programming language, right? So, um, or any editor does. So uh, the goal is, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to make it easy to communicate between your program and external systems, right? And that is what I feel like my job is, because that's the terrible thing about C++, is it C++ almost doesn't want to communicate at all, right? Um, so my job is to enable that kind of communication. Um, I don't think my job is to write plugins for editors or whatever. I think that's, if other people want to do that, that's cool. All right, I'm tired. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out. What time is it? It's 1.30. So we went for an hour and a half. It was mo largely questions. Um, but that was fun. We haven't done one of these in a long time. Next one probably won't be this late at night. Um, but thanks for coming, everybody. And I'll post this on YouTube if you missed some of it. And uh, yeah. Good night.